I'm Ken Rosen, and uh, delighted to welcome you to our uh, ULI Real Estate Economic Forecast uh, session. We have four great panelists, and of course, you know who they all are. They're on the program. Uh, but we're going to start with a, a presentation of the ULI forecast and consensus forecast. Uh, ULI does a survey, it was about a month ago that we did this, uh, of 47 economists and real estate investors uh, about what they think is going to happen in the economy. So I'm going to present not my forecast, not our panel's forecast, but uh, what the ULI forecast, consensus forecast is. And then we're going to break it into chunks. We're going to do the real economy, we're going to do capital markets, and then different product types. And we're going to ask the various panelists to comment in various ways on this. So we're going to do this in chunks, and then you'll have uh, time at the end to ask questions as well. So remember, this is not my forecast. You know that I, uh, this is the ULI consensus forecast that many of you filled out. And just to give you a little more details, 48 economists and analysts at 34 uh, leading real estate organizations uh, responded. It was conducted in, the, uh, in September. Uh, and uh, we do this every six months. Anita Kramer and her unit do this every six months. And uh, consensus, turns out last time, was mostly right. So we'll see if it still is. So we start with the most important thing, which is uh, the economic growth. And again, I say it's a three-year forecast, but it really is only two years, because uh, we are almost done with this uh, 2017. Seems like it's been a really long year. But uh, two more to go, uh, 2018 and 19, I guess three more to go. Uh, but the growth forecast here is remain in the 2% range. So it's a very modest change, uh, really no significant change, 2% plus growth, but not much more than that. Job growth slows, according to the consensus view, and the job growth slowing is primarily because we have used up our surplus labor. So it's hard to create jobs when you have labor shortages. And we do have a huge labor shortages all around the country, especially in construction and other areas. So I think that's the reason for the slowdown. Uh, the unemployment rate is very low, 4.2%. Uh, you can see the forecast is it remains essentially the same. We have the lowest unemployment claims, first unemployment claims, in 40 years. So we have a red hot labor market. GDP doesn't show up, but the labor market's red hot. Again, the consensus forecast doesn't see much change in inflation. Thinks inflation is about 2%, going to remain 2%. So they don't see any acceleration at all. And that's the consensus view. And then one final macro uh, point is they do think interest rates are going to edge up, uh, edge up to about 3% over the next uh, two and a half or two and a quarter years. So it's a very bland forecast. But when you have consensus, bland is the way we go. So I'm going to go down the uh, list of our panelists and ask them one at a time to tell us what is this their view and then what is the one shock to the system that might make this forecast more positive and one shock that might make it more negative. And Melissa, since you're sitting here on the immediate side, we'll start with you. Okay, sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's largely in line. Um, it's probably a little more optimistic than, than I am, so I, I bet GDP is around 2% for the next couple years. I don't see the 10-year moving um, much above, you know, 25, 26. I, I would find it hard to believe that it hits 3% um, by 2019. Um, but that's largely just because I tend to think that we're in a long-term structural low interest rate environment. Um, and so I guess when you say what's the biggest uh, positive or negative surprise, so I, I think one of the things I think about is what if we're just in this for a long time? So what if it's just, you know, I think everyone's saying, well, what ending are we in and isn't there a recession on the way or when does all that happen? Well, what if there's not and what if we're just kind of at 2% and, you know, these interest rates for the next 5, 6, 7, 10, 10 years, right? Um, sort of means if you're waiting for, if you're waiting for a recession, you're waiting for commercial property prices to fall, probably not going to happen. So if you're sort of on the sidelines, uh, you might be quite disappointed uh, in the next five or ten years if the recession doesn't happen. Um, on the upside, though, you know, let's say I, I think it kind of would be a, pro a positive if there was some sort of economic disruption that sort of jolted us out of the three, this sort of modest growth and this tenure that doesn't really move, I actually think that would be a positive. Um, I don't know what that would be. 
Um, but if, you know, say we fell into a recession and then actually I would be, view that kind of as a positive, maybe prices fall, um, a little more, more of a buying opportunity. Um, but then after that, you actually got into a more of a growth mode than what we've seen in the last, you know, almost eight years now. Um, so that's my view. Thanks, Mr. So Hans, what do you think about this? Well, I think that we're going to have pretty widespread consensus on the panel within 50 basis points for the next couple of years on GDP growth. Um, so that part is not, not terribly, terribly interesting. And as, as, as you mentioned last week, Ken, we're on a prep call for this. You know, boring for commercial real estate has been fantastic for five years. You know, 2% rent growth, low cap rates, low interest rates, it's been a great ride. Um, so two more years of the same. We'll have some slowing growth. We have more supply. Um, cap rates have stabilized. They're less likely. To, they're more likely to be stable than, than significantly down. But you know, it, it's a good story. What I think is most likely to bring the wheels off of this bus, my personal opinion, uh, in terms of, of whether we'd have a recession, would be a mini tech wreck. Maybe not as bad as 2000, but um, you know, we see a lot of firms out there tech firms that don't make money. Remember, this is different from 20 years ago when most of the tech firms didn't make money. So here we've got a, a minority of tech startup firms not making money, unicorns without cash flow. And um, we have seen decreasing venture capital deal flow and decreasing venture capital investment flow in the Bay Area over the last three years. Um, you know, we see more companies trying to get to market, trying to sell, it's not really a great environment for that. So I think we could be smelling the end of this right now uh, in the Bay Area. We see increasing sublease space availabilities in office. And, and my, my favorite is uh, WeWork buying the Lord & Taylor store, which just came out a few days ago. And, and the Wall Street Journal did a really nice job on them last Friday uh, before that was announced. And you know I looked at the income of WeWork, and it's not just that it's $130,000 for every person that comes in and rents a desk that could cancel in two months. It's that it's a 2-2 cap on property they don't own. And it, it smells a lot like when AOL bought Time Warner, the purchase of this building. So I think the most likely place for this to, to come apart would be tech markets. And most recessions are not like the last one. They're regional. Uh, they hurt in distinct places. And other parts of the country are not so bad. So overall, even if we get into a recession, you know, to build on Melissa's point, you know, it doesn't have to feel like 2009. Hans, thank you. Uh, just being a Bay Area person, we have 162 unicorns. These are companies that uh, are worth over a billion dollars but don't make money, and they're private, and they're leasing lots of space. So leasing actually in San Francisco itself actually accelerated the last while. Uh, big leases, uh, some from the giants like a Facebook and others, but we worry a lot that at least half these companies 10 years from now won't be here. The question, does it burst this year, next year, or the year after? The main reason it's an issue is all the people they've been hiring to scale uh, and losing money on making it up in the volume, they lose it. Uh, at some point, they have to become profitable. We could say that about Amazon. And I love that Prime Now delivery. They lose $5 every time they deliver me that one bottle of soda I want. I love it. But uh, I think it's going to be a big issue. So let's now turn to uh, uh, two other panelists. Uh, Lee, uh, does this consensus forecast look right to you? And what could disrupt this? Yesterday, when I was um, flying uh, from New York in my long flight in the middle seat, I was debating whether or not to take another look at these or take a nap. And, um, we, 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 <laughs> and, we, and we talked about this because we all sort of read this and wanted to take a nap because it seems very boring. Um, and, and instead, I, I, I went and I looked at the change since the last forecast, and that's six months ago. Um, and actually, there, there's been some pretty significant differences there. Um, and, and really, that, that suggests that um, all of us, uh, all 40 whatever of us that submitted to this. F 48 have, economists. I didn't know there were that many real estate economists. <laughs> um, have, have really settled into this lower for longer um, thesis. And, 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 and really, so you've seen. Um, the outlook for the 10-year Treasury rate, um, the, the, this group expected it to be 3.2% in 2018. That's come down to 27 now. Um, we expected unemployment to be higher. We expected GDP growth to be higher, um, all the above. So really, um, to me, that, that, that's a little bit interesting in that, that we are buying this cycle 
continuing along, even though it's long in the tooth, um, without a lot of signs of a lot of disruptions. And that, that, that's not inconsistent with our view. Um, but, but if we look at the risks, and, and, and starting with the downside risk, um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to identify uh, the tech one as being uh, a risk in the sense of a, a, a major macroeconomic risk. It could be a regional risk. Uh, it, it could be a risk certainly to the tech markets. Um, but most of the larger tech companies are very integrated with the, the overall economy. Uh, and so the likelihood of them uh, facing a big downturn without a, an economic event is it, pretty slim at this point. Um, instead, I would point to something uh, that uh, the, the, the number of things that we really haven't thought of in a lot of ways. There could be uh, a banking crisis in Europe. I, I think it's a risk that isn't on uh, our immediate radar. And then when I look at the upside risk, and, and, and I think there is some upside risk to this, um, we, would, we would point to policy certainty, uh, of which there is zero uh, at the moment. Um, six months ago, I think we had an indication uh, around, around policy, taxes, trade, immigration, um, all the above. And, and, and our consensus around that was that that would be a net positive. And, and at the moment, that policy certainty is actually weaker now. Uh, than it was. So uh, if there was some sort of policy certainty uh, that we gained over the next six months, I think that that would probably, uh, probably affect these forecasts more likely on the upside than the downside. Okay. And uh, Bill, we last, what, is, you, what do you guys think of this forecast and what's the one thing that you'd worry about and one thing you might think could make things better? Sure. Um, so I agree with Hans and that the uh, last seven years of sort of moderate two to two and a half percent growth with low interest rates has been great for real estate. We've had seven years of double digit increase returns uh, that actually came down to single digit last year, but a great, great run for real estate. And as I look at the, the forecast, it's more of the same. It's two and a half percent, uh, two to two and a half percent GDP growth and, you know, fairly low interest rates in the scheme of things. Um, I think there's more upside to the GDP numbers than downside. I think we could be you know, easily be around three, but the issue is that the magnitude of the upside is a lot less than the magnitude of the downside. And so we could have maybe get up to high twos or threes for GDP growth, but it could be a look a lot worse on the downside. And, and the, you know, I, I don't know what's gonna cause it. And I, I'm not a believer in this, you know, recessions run out of time. Um, we, we, according to this forecast, we will set the record for the longest expansion ever. So, I mean, uh, expansions run out of time. We'll set the record, the, the longest was 120 months during the Clinton administration. I think in mid-2019, we eclipsed that. So we could well have the longest um, expansion since records were kept in the mid-1800s. Now, Canada and uh, Australia have had 20-year runs of no recession. So it, there's no rule that says you have to have one. But what could change things? And I look at sort of a, a, a wide range of black swans, many of them not in the US, so obviously North Korea, uh, Brexit, uh, China, all sorts of things could go you know, sideways or, or negative and affect the US. And then we have in February a new Fed chair. Um, uh, Lee talked about policy uncertainty. We have a lot of policy uncertainty about the, what the Fed does and, and, and Fed tightening has been a, a cause in many, in many past instances of, of a recession. So, I view it as a lot of things that are low probability, high impact, hard to isolate any one of them. Okay, well, as moderator, I'm gonna give you mine. I think the biggest thing we don't see is that Federal Reserve and central bank policies in the world are shifting. We've had the most extreme monetary policy stimulus the last seven or eight years, and we've all benefited. But now the central bank here, the present dovish central bank has said, we're going to raise short rates. Their consensus is, by the end of the forecast period, to two and three quarters. If they do that, the 10-year bond isn't going to stay at 3%. It just isn't. Uh, today, it's at the 247. I think it gets to 280 by year end, and I think we're at 4% by the end of 219. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that affects cap rates dramatically. So I think that's our biggest risk. And the risk comes from not just changing monetary policy, reducing their portfolio of $4.5 trillion of bonds and mortgages to two trillion over the next three years, that's a lot. The deficit running 700 billion a year for the next three years, that's another two trillion of extra bonds. So a lot of bonds coming on the market. Now it is true that Germany rates are 48 basis points and Japan six basis points, so capital flows can keep that from rising. But I think the shock to the system is gonna be 
inflation, which has been dormant for a long time, 1.9% CPI year over year, all of a sudden it's going to pick up. We have the tightest labor market we've had in a long time. So wage growth and inflation will be get that 3% inflation number. If that's the case, it's hard to see the 10-year bond remaining at these levels. So I think that's the number one risk. The second is we have this uh, America first policy and it's spreading globally. You know, Brexit, one example, Europe, the same thing. Trade flows and immigration are the reason that we're getting this populist things happening. The reason we have a person in the White House, we do. Uh, if we go into a trade war, we drop NAFTA uh, or start imposing large tariffs on uh, imports, um, I think that could have a big negative effect. Uh, and the other thing to say is we have had a formal proposal by the administration to cut legal immigration in half, from a million a year to half a million. And they put a bill in Congress, the nativist, nativist view led by our whatever you call our president. Uh, I won't use the words that Tillerson used, but uh, it's a huge mistake because half of our population growth comes from immigration, legal immigration. And this is a very important thing for the housing market, but for all of us in real estate. Uh, we've added 10 million people each decade legally, and that's really uh, been a very important source of economic growth and job creation. And especially in places like uh, California, Texas, Florida, New York, it's a big thing. So uh, I think those could upset the apple cart. Then finally, let me just say North Korea. We didn't want to use those words, but I think uh, it's scary. And if that happens, all of this happens, what it does is upset the financial markets. Led to a big correction uh, in our financial markets, both uh, interest rates and, of course, S&P. And if that happens, real estate is not immune. We're a derived demand, so remember that, derived demand. All right, so we'll go to the next section, which is capital markets in more detail on real estate. So the consensus view is that cap rates hardly move at all. They move up by 30 basis points. The consensus forecast uh, is they hardly move. On the other hand, we've already had trans transaction volume, consensus view. Uh, it was down 12% actual numbers in 2016. It's actually down about 19% this year. The forecast doesn't reflect that, but transaction volume declining. So remember, on the transaction as a buyer and seller. So what's going on here? We're going to ask our panelists this question. Uh, CMBS volume, uh, our consensus view is it's flat. The consensus is already wrong. We expect to see maybe $100 billion in 2017. It's been a surge in the market there. We're going to talk about debt markets, and Lee in particular has got some good, good views there. The consensus view is that inflation uh, in real estate values uh, slows, but it's still positive, running 3 to 5% a year. Sort of not really consistent with rising cap rates. So we want to ask that question after being double digit for a long time. So we're going to stop at this point. We're then going to get to the fundamentals. So we're going to do capital markets. And, and maybe I can turn to Lee first, because the debt markets are so important to real estate, and there's been some uh, Dramatic changes, debt funds, uh, spread compression, uh, CMBS revival. So, Lee, maybe start with you. Yes, I, I looked at this um, CMBS forecast, which shows flat CMBS issuance for the next three years. And that, um, as Ken pointed out, is definitely going to be wrong, uh, at least this year. Uh, it may be wrong by a big magnitude uh, in the next couple of years. And I think that that's what's mirroring um, something that is happening in the debt markets. It's one of the few big changes that we've seen in real estate capital markets overall. Um, starting with the CMBS markets, uh, the outlook was very negative last year um, because of some uh, regulatory things, risk retention rules, um, that uh, uh, the consensus was that was going to slow issuance. Um, it turned out that investors love risk retention rules and actually um, have been plowing money into CMBS because of that. And so that the, the, the amount of debt that, that they have been providing to real estate markets uh, continues to increase, albeit it is more focused on higher quality properties in uh, larger markets than it was. Um, then, then you look at banks. Uh, banks are also continue to be um, very active lenders. Um, if anything, they're facing a slightly lighter regulata regulatory regime than they were a year ago. Um, so they continue to be very active uh, lenders for stabilized properties. Um, they are lending on construction, although uh, the standards are tight. Um, and they're even venturing into sort of that middle ground of value-add or repositioning more so 
uh, than they were a year ago. Um, and then the third thing is you look at the number of debt funds that have been raised uh, mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, and, and these debt funds have a substantial amount of money, uh, and, and we've already been seeing that impact on the market. Um, where you, you do have this availability of debt that's a little bit higher up in the capital stack than you might have had access to 18 months ago. Um, so you put all that together, and um, uh, on, on the plus side, that might loosen up transaction markets. It might prolong um, the, the, the capital market cycle a little longer, may keep cap rates, uh, that, that cap rate forecast may be uh, about right. Uh, on the minus side, you do worry a little bit about underwriting standards uh, and also, if there's any uh, break in uh, construction lending, any increase in that uh, related to these uh, more debt availability, that would be something else to look for on the downside. You know, the Fed is still saying uh, that construction lending is tightening based on their mm -hmm. survey, but I think you're pointing out all these other sources are right. loosening and getting bigger. No, none of which are sources for construction lending per se, but I think that that, that pressure to put money out at some point uh, can filter through Although, on the construction side. So, so Bill, let's ask you this question because JLL is big in this business, transaction volumes are declining. Why is that happening? Uh, and uh, what does it mean? Well, it's from a really high base. So I mean, we right. set a record year in, in a couple years ago. So, um, and, and you know, the prices are high. So there's a, and, and the other thing is you've got some sectors that there's, there's no trade going on. So uh, regional malls, power centers, mm -hmm. suburban office, you, know, you could probably sell those two years ago. Uh, really hard to do today. So I think a uh, combination of high prices and, uh, for core properties mm -hmm. and then more pro sub-property types getting into this no trade zone, I think that's where you're seeing the, the, the decline coming from. So it's really a bid-ass spread issue that uh, sellers may not have adjusted to the new reality that their property type isn't favored and buyers are less aggressive. Melissa, you guys do debt and equity both. Uh, one of the biggest players. What do you? How do you make? What do you make of this uh, declining transaction volume, but still strong lending? Sure. Um, so I think there's a couple things. So uh, declining transaction volume. It could be buyers full prices are you know high, whatever that means, and sort of saying, and I'm full on real estate. My real estate allocation because I've you know loaded up on it in the last seven, six, seven years. So I'm good. I'll just sort of hang back. I don't. I don't need to buy. Um, so I think that's one part of it. Um, in the lending market is, you know, when you think about this whole cap rate discussion and where treasuries are going, then you think about the lending market because they're all sort of fixed income products. I think there's one important thing to sort of like realize that a more macro picture is just sort of there's a ton of spread investors out there. So think about, you know, life, we'll just take Life Company, for example, right? There's spread investors. and so. You know, when you think about, well, you know, all this MBS rolling off of the Federal Reserve, um, a lot of spread investors will like that stuff, right? It's just a little more spready than, you know, what you're going to get in a government bond. Um, and you think about it on commercial mortgage side as well, spread investors kind of love those products too because they'll give you <clears throat> a spread over, certainly for commercial mortgages and certainly for higher risk commercial mortgages, they'll give you a great spread over corporates um, all day long. And so there is, there's really good appetite um, for a mortgage. And I think it, particularly at this point in the cycle, because I think in particular, if you're a fixed income spread investor, you'll say to yourself, well, um, relative to commercial equity, kind of going forward the next couple years, I'm probably going to get about the same total return from a mortgage as I will equity. Because um, if you look at sort of, you think total returns for equity will be kind of 5% or whatever. Um, depending if you put leverage on your mortgage, you could get there as well. And you could say, I'm actually taking less risk with the mortgage than the equity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of that kind of big macro stuff that, that goes on in, in sort of these asset allocations, you know, particularly for um, life codes or anyone who runs a multi-asset um, portfolio. I think that's really part of really uh, why debt funds have really risen, because there is that opportunity that feels like a better space in the capital stack for the moment. So Hans, look at this chart here. Are we going to see real estate values still increase? It's definitely a mixed bag if you look at property types and subtypes. So take uh, high-end multifamily. So if you look at new construction multifamily, here in LA, I think there's about uh, 4,000 units that are going to be delivering within a couple miles of this address over the course of the next two years. Some of them are leasing up well. 
but with a little bit of increase in interest rates, a little bit of uh, worry about uh, what the net effect of rents are. Some of these deals aren't penciling as well as, as you might have thought a couple years ago. Also in LA, workforce housing, bulletproof, four or five percent rent growth in some areas. So, you know, first of all, I would say the averages, and we can work with the math, but I think what's more interesting is what's underneath it as far as is the investment scenarios. Yeah, so that's actually a good, good transition. Let's turn to the fundamentals next. So we're going to take you through each property type, but we're going to stop at each one and get your opinions. The hottest property type has been industrial warehouse. Uh, vacancy rates uh, here, it says 777, seven, seven, while LA it's 1.2. So uh, in many markets, vacancy rates are below 5%. Mm -hmm. So it's been a very tight market. Uh, rent growth is happening in a big way. This sector never has big rent growth, but it actually is happening uh, in this sector because the vacancy rates are very tight. According to the consensus, it's all going to slow down, but still positive. And returns, it's the only product type that had double-digit returns in 2016. You can see the slowing forecast here. So what do we think of warehouses? And again, we'll maybe go the other direction. Uh, start with our fundamental analyst there, Hans. What, do you, what is your, your view on warehouses? Industrial has been a real surpriser for the past three years because there hasn't been as much supply as you'd think there would be. The, the capital availability, REITs have had capital availability, but, but they've chosen to really you know, grow their NOI, not get out over their skis and do build to suits. So they haven't gotten out with speculative construction. A lot of the local and regional players haven't had access to capital for this until recently and are always loath to put in their own money on spec. So, so it's been a real surprise how little supply there's been in industrial. At the same time, the demand growth is double GDP growth on a percentage basis. Historically, the last 40 years, percentage change in industrial demand and percentage change in GDP kind of goes hand in hand. And that's true for the last two economic cycles. This time it's been double because industrial is the new retail. So it's just been the perfect sunny day for industrial. Okay. What we expect is, is over the course of the next year, we'll have more supply. And, and if I was sitting here two years ago, I would have said the same thing. So um, supply has been stubbornly low. So there, there might be a little upside in these numbers, particularly for light industrial infill, especially in major markets. You can't pencil to build it. Um, it tends to be close to where the consumers are, and it's very dependent on housing. Sure. So yeah, this is, a, this is a, a remarkably good story. That's not going to be true four years from now, but the next year, I think the sun the sun's still shining. Okay. I just so, uh, Bill, let's ask you. Yeah. Uh, are you are you guys your view, and then are you over or under allocating for the next couple of years industrial in your portfolio warehouse industrial yeah. in your portfolio? So I think we have 27 warehouse developments under construction right now. It's it's our biggest bet. We've been doing that for three or four years, um, and we have a team that just does that. They they have, they use local partners. Um, we think it's the best risk-adjusted bet we have right now, um, assuming uh, markets hold up and pricing holds up. But you know, it's also a six to nine, twelve-month window to get in and out, um, and we're we're getting really good pre-leasing. So we've we've taken a lot of risk off of those developments. So we think it's terrific. Um, to Hans's point of supply, there is overall less supply, but it really varies by market. And we find the West Coast, almost all the West Coast markets are well below where they were in previous cycles in terms of supply, New York, New Jersey. But you go to New Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, just as much supply as prior cycles because there's plenty of land. So we're, we're finally getting to some, some, part, some markets where there truly are land and supply constraints for the type of warehouse that, you know, sort of minimum 200,000 feet that we're looking at. Really hard to find those sites. Um, pretty, pretty much have to take something else down which adds cost. So it's, it's really not, it's a, it's, it, it's a tale of sort of the coasts and, and, and central U.S. for where there are supply constraints. And we think that'll lead to uh, much different rent growth over the next five years. And, and Lee, how about you? Are you under over allocated to uh, industrial? Uh, over, and here's why. I, I think there's a mismatch between where there's availability of land and the ability to construct uh, industrial properties and, 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 and where that demand for those industrial properties is. So um, there are actually com supply constraints in uh, almost every metro area for that last mile industrial, where for the first time industrial is competing with other land uses. Um, it used to be that the industrial would just be built further and further out from a city, and you still have that, and there's still demand for that. Um, but what's changed is that proximity to the consumers and to businesses. 
uh, and, and the need for that. And so, uh, in our view, it's, it's likely that those, those properties in the last mile closer in um, are probably going to be generating a lot of that return, more than that return, uh, and a lot of that rent growth as well. And Melissa, last, I made you last year, but how does TIA uh, view industrial and uh, under or over allocated? Um, <clears throat> I'd say probably um, under allocated. Um, however, if I, I agree with what everyone just said um, in, in over weighting it or over allocating towards it, um, given the, the fundamentals of it. Um, I tend to agree that you know the urban infill looks looks really strong. Um, I do wonder about you know you hear a lot about like the driverless trucks um, and that being a technology that's far ahead of driverless cars. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not, but in the event that it is, what that does to the industrial market, I think it, I think the urban infill actually does pretty well uh, in that. But I I do wonder what it means for. Um, some of the bigger box um, stuff that's, you know, in outer suburbs of Chicago or Houston or wherever. Um, but overall, I would say I'm, I'm equally optimistic as the other panelists. So let me give you the, not only the driverless trucks, by the way, if you drive in L.A., it looks like the trucks are driverless now. <laughs> so be careful. But uh, a couple of things to say. NAFTA and trade. Well, e-commerce is driving a lot of the growth. NAFTA and trade are very important. Our, our ports, uh, again, the, the large containers coming through our ports are up 5 to 6 percent this year. If we do something to disrupt trade, that would not be good for the business. Secondly, Amazon is, I think, 60 percent of the volume of new construction. Is Amazon really a credit? I go back to that story again. So e-commerce, I think, has got a run to go, and it's probably going to continue, but I'd say a little bit more cautious here. All the investment community, this is all they want. They really want this badly, and everyone's over-allocated. Uh, and I think for the next couple of years, uh, we had uh, Hamid Mogadan, who runs Prologis, said, still looks likely strong in the next couple of years. Okay, so let's do retail, a sector that no one loves. Uh, retail vacancy rates are only up a little bit, according to the consensus, not up very much. Uh, uh, rent rates are slowing. But still positive. This sort of seems inconsistent with the story we're hearing out there. And returns are in the uh, 5 to 6 percent range slowing. So retail uh, is not viewed to do anything other than slow, uh, but not talking about the disruption. And of course, the financial markets have pushed the value of uh, retail REITs down 25 percent. Many of the big retailers, uh, J.C. Penney, Sears, uh, are having struggling. Uh, so what's the outlook here? And I know there's uh, obviously many different categories of retail. So we'll start with uh, Melissa on this one. We'll go the other direction. Uh, how do you guys view retail? I know there's no one retail. So maybe give us a little taxonomy and how you view retail. And is T uh, TIA putting more money in retail or cutting back their allocations? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm actually quite bullish on the sector. You know, I, just as Ken said, it's not you know just one sector. But um, so what I think here's why I'm bullish. So first of all, I think that the, everything you read in the headlines, I bet the headlines get worse, right? So I bet more retailers continue to file bankruptcy. Um, you know, more store closings. I think there's probably a whole segment of retail um, that exists today that either um, will become non-institutional quality, um, will become obsolete if that's what you say is non-institutional quality, somehow maybe repurposed. I don't know, but there's a whole segment that just, it's not very good. Like you go into it and it's awful. Like everything about it's terrible. Like it looks bad, the retailers are bad, you go into the stores, you can't find anything. It's, it's a disaster. Um, I think a lot of that is not a good bet. Then I think there is the whole other segment that will We'll, we'll get what's going on. There are retailers who are investing heavily in all the technology to compete against Amazon. They're doing a good job of it, investing billions of dollars. I um, think they'll be fine. There's a lot of off-price that are doing really well, retailers. Um, I think that'll continue. And so I think then there's a whole segment of retail which will, which will survive in the coming decades and will be completely fine. I also think, though, that those that survive will look entirely different than they look today. So when you go into a store, when you go into a retail center today, some of it, like I said, can be totally disastrous. And maybe a decade from now, you go in and it's much more curated, right? So retailers will know 
demographics of everyone who walks into that retail center and they will tailor all their products to the demographics in that area. And so you'll walk in, it'll be a great experience. You'll love it. I mean, they'll have everything you want. You'll be able to find things. It'll be sort of a very seamless thing. It'll be much more curated. It'll have the food you want, the entertainment you want, all of that. And I think, it, I think we'll come out of this looking, retail will look much better. You'll enjoy your shopping experience much more. But I do think the next five or 10 years is, is, looks really rough. Lee, what's your view and what's your favorite type of retail that you're still both lending and investing in and what, where don't you want to put a dollar? Let me, let me just clarify. Did you say you were optimistic, Melissa? I'm optimistic about oh the, I'm that, optimistic about the um, segment of retail that continues to exist. If that's I'm very pe pessimistic about the stuff that, you know. Dies. Yeah. If, that's, if that's the optimistic scenario, uh, I'm not sure what to say here. Um, we, 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 <laughs> With the two segments, I think um, internally the discussions we have um, when we talk about retail, um, the words that we tend to uh, come up with is resiliency, survival, insulated. Um, these are all defensive words, and I think that that's the environment that retail is going to be operating in. Um, if you look at sort of either end of the barbell, um, starting with your neighborhood and community centers with a grocery store in an area that's infill, um, lots of wealthy people living nearby, population density, um, those centers um, are probably, uh, not only are going to do fine, but probably will do even better uh, over, over the next few years. Um, you look at the other end of the spectrum with this sort of these large scale mixed use, uh, experiential retail, lots of food and beverage, lots of entertainment options. Um, those are actually doing quite well. Um, the commonality there is both of those um, are, are much more oriented towards selling um, services, food, uh, non-goods things. Everything else in the middle, um, I think those, those defensive words uh, are, are pretty much going to be the, the rule for the next, uh, the next five years at least. Bill, uh, how about you? Sure, Over sir. underweight retail and is, what do you do with the B and C malls that don't work? Asking uh, a really tough question. Well, so we, we've, we've been underweight in malls for the last five or 10 years and it's, it's hurt us a lot. That's been the best, one of the best performing property types. We think that's gonna turn around and help us in the next five or 10 years. So we're underweight retail, underweight malls. Um, I will say I, I would be, I would love to sort of, I'd rather own um, Simon property at a mid five cap rate than um, own the malls that they own, which are probably low to mid four cap rates. So there's a, a great arbitrage right now. And I think the Simon property malls are great and will will survive. They may require some capital to um, replace some tenants over time, but they're great locations. And you know, that's that's really good value. Um, yeah, no, it's a tough sector. Um, the, the, the only place that's really hot right now is supermarket anchored centers. Um, that's still trading very dearly, and institutional investors are trying to put all their retail into that, that one area. Um, another sort of uh, a thing I, we follow a lot of the public companies and uh, Federal Realty, which I, I admire a lot, and they've got great assets, great real estate. They just came out and said that you know they, they focus on both density and income, high incomes, as they're you know try to have both. They said going forward, we're really going to focus on density because we think that there will be a lot of turnover among tenants and they think density will serve you better than higher income because you'll have a, a wider range of people that you can appeal to with either services or some, some new retail concept. So that's something we're thinking about too is trying to be more in some of the dense urban areas that we think that'll outperform. And Hans, what do the numbers show about retail? Well, um, first of all, I would say that I think Melissa and Lee don't, don't disagree maybe as much as it might seem at first. I think that 25% uh, of the retail out there, I think you would, you'd agree, is pretty sound stuff. Experiential, restaurant, et cetera. You know, what the numbers say, you know, we, we score every, every retail storefront in America according to the built environment, the demographics, the change in demographics, the amount of office, the amount of hotel, you know, the, the rent for the office, the traffic patterns. And, and we find that you know, quite a bit of it should be retenantable for something, even if it's got a Sears in it. So, um, and then there's probably 40% of the retail that you, you just wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Like it's just demolition waiting to happen and you hope you can put an apartment building there someday. So I think it, you know, it's very dramatic, but you know, in this huge change, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, in terms of some specific numbers to, to not avoid uh, uh, the question, 
We had 70 million square foot of closures through the second quarter of this year. We had 45 million last year, year to date. And in, in comparison, there were 28 million in the first six months of 08. So yeah, actually, there's as much closure out there as it looks like. And we haven't even seen January yet. That's when the big closures come. So I think we're looking at about 110 million feet of closures, uh, a lot of it in BNC malls, uh, to Ken's point. And it's going to be a real you know, storm. But I think on the other side, there's a lot of opportunity as well. Yeah. And I would just add, from my perspective, we're in the third inning of this transformation. Mm -hmm. We still haven't seen the full effects yet. Uh, so I think we should uh, hold our breath. And even the best, best uh, retail, which is experiential, our restaurant's really a very good investment in credit. We need them, but that's another issue. Uh, and the actual traffic is down for almost all retail product types. And again, the e-commerce growth is 14 15%. But the penetration is still pretty small. So I think, uh, again, if my billion dollars is underweight, even the best things, grocery anchored, is still underweight, I would say. Ken, one of our... Uh uh, industrial developments was on a failed mall in Atlanta, so you, know, you can tear it down like and that. build industrial. Like the new yeah. retail. Okay, so let's do office, the biggest sector of real estate. Uh, again, the consensus forecast is slight upward trend in vacancy rates, uh, uh, new construction causing that. Uh, very little rent growth on average nationally. Uh, again, consensus here, uh, and returns 5 to 6 percent. The looks from this the second least good sector. So uh, we'll start maybe in the, with Hans here. What do the numbers show for office and, uh, uh, and the outlook? And then we'll go again uh, down the panel. So if you talk about the 40 metropolitan areas that most of the big institutional investors here would, would spend a lot of time in, um, there's about, say, seven or eight of them that have significant amounts of supply underway. And after that, the percentage of inventory underway is fairly low. Um, while we may have a little bit more construction financing availability through the funds, et cetera, that Lee mentioned earlier over the course of the next two years, the banks are really being told by the regulators, the OCC, the Fed, that they don't want construction lending on the books. So overall supply is pretty stable. Um, a lot of these metros, secondary and tertiary metros, are not investor, institutional investor favorites for new construction. So it's a pretty good story overall for office, only for good office. Four and five star office, class A office, um, that's been about 55% of demand the last couple of years, but only about one third of the inventory. Um, unemployment rate, as was pointed out earlier, in the low fours, one of the ways you get talent is you have a decent office. This means that 1980s, poor TI office buildings in bad locations, you know, are they the BNC malls of five years from now? I don't know, but they're not a good story and they're not worth buying. Um, so it's definitely a high-end story, and there's a lot of secondary and tertiary markets where it's really their turn to shine for a couple of years. Okay, let's uh, switch to Bill. How about suburban office, Bill? What do you think of that, uh, and uh, what's your strategy, your company strategy? Well, we have very little suburban office, which has been good recently. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to look at it. The pricing is getting pretty interesting, and particularly with, with some amenities, with some transit. Uh, Uber helps a lot in making these things more accessible. So, you know, it's, it's a four cap for good New York office, and it's a seven or eight cap for some of the suburbs, and you just have to pick your spots. So I think the, between the rents, the pricing, and, and there is still is economic activity. It's not everybody's gonna be moving to a downtown office. So I think we're, we're, we're there may be some, the, we may be shifting to where, uh, you know, the, the, we're, we're at the bottom for suburban office probably. Uh, Lee, how about you guys? What's your is office under or over allocated going forward? And office is probably still, uh, residually probably a pretty big part of your portfolio. It is, and we moved to an overweight um, about three or four years ago in anticipation of um, what, what we expected to be was a lot of rent growth, a lot of decline in vacancy, um, all of which happened. Um, the, the thing that didn't happen was returns weren't that great. And the reason the returns haven't been that great is that you have to put a ton of capital into these office buildings on an ongoing basis. Typically at this point in a cycle, uh, you should see particularly tenant improvements, um, which is another way of saying you give tenants a bunch of money up front in exchange for it over the course of 10 years. Um, usually those come down, even go to zero near the end of a cycle. 
they've stayed the same. They've actually gone up in some markets. Uh, and so because of that, um, our outlook on the office has really been, the, the recovery hasn't been um, as good as we expected. It hasn't hurt us, but it hasn't helped us as much as we expected. Uh, and, and we're pretty comfortable going to an underway because we just don't see these capital requirements coming down anytime soon. And Melissa, last but not least in office, do you guys like office and over underweight and suburban office? Yep. I, well, I tend to agree with Lee on the CapEx argument. So I, I, I tend to generally think office should be underweighted, um, definitely at this point in the cycle when it's certainly seen a run up in prices, not suburban office, but most other types of office have. And then you've got to put all the CapEx into it, and so your return just it will not be very good at this point in the cycle. Um, if you could buy it on a dip, sure, I think you could, you could do okay with it. Um, a suburban office, uh, it could be an interesting play in very select regions, you know, to Bill's point, uh, stuff that's well located, uh, not the commodity B stuff out in suburban locations. I think that could, that might be a play. Um, I wonder what, you know, in the sector, you, you hear a lot about what are the structural changes happening in, in, for office space. So um, came across my desk the other day was, you know, what happens if WeWork were to become such a large uh, tenant? And, you know, they came back to landlords and said, okay, well, you know, we're like X percent of your office space and, you know, you need to cut our rent 50 percent. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. Whether, I mean, it was a hypothetical, hypothetical scenario. So there's, there's stuff like that that makes me wonder about what are the structural uh, long-term implications of office and it also makes me you know even less uh, bullish about it and not that I was very bullish about it to begin with um, so bearish uh, bearish to say it bearish I was, yes I was yeah uh, and then I just also wonder with you know the head count or sort of you know more people in less space I don't I don't, I don't know that that you know that probably stays for, for quite a while so overall I'm just generally bearish. Uh, well, the problem with office, I think, is this adaptive reuse stuff has really done quite well, but uh, it's hard to find those buildings to do that with now. Suburban tells you, get the money in cash flow. It's all about cash flow after CapEx. These returns in Nickery, by the way, do not take into account CapEx. Remember that. So it's really all about cash flow, and I want 80, 85, 90 percent of my return, sure cash flow. Don't think you're going to get cap rate compression. In the Class A office, that's not going to happen anymore. Class B, you get a high yield going in, finance it, lock it, and uh, that's how you make your money. All right, so let's uh, switch to my favorite property type. The consensus uh, is that the apartment market is uh, seeing rising vacancy rates, but not dramatically, but edging up. Uh, the uh, rent growth is slowing dramatically. It already slowed in 2016, especially for some of the big urban areas, class high end, class luxury apartments. Uh, they have it running about 2% a year, the consensus, which is down from 4 to 5% a year, uh, and returns again uh, in the 5% range. So their view on apartments is uh, still good, but not as good. Uh, and so uh, let me uh, start uh, with Hans on numbers. Uh, is this consistent with your view on apartments? and? Have we, at least in Class A apartments, you already talked about that, but let's talk about Class B and C, the, mm -hmm. the working person's apartments. Is there an affordability issue there? You know, I appreciate you bringing that up, and I've, I spent a lot of time uh, researching workforce housing and did a paper with the Terwilliger Center here at ULI last year, and I think it's, uh, what surprised me about it as we delved into the numbers was not just that it's the right thing to do, but it, that's been so remunerative, uh, workforce housing. If you look at Class C housing, um, you could argue that inventory growth is negative. You can definitely see that the rent growth is positive. And uh, there isn't enough supply overall to upset the apple cart that far underneath the, the you know, if, if, if the four and five star are over here at the, at the top of the ocean where the waves happen, you know, the Class C workforce housing is down here where it's pretty still. So uh, that we found is pretty resilient and Class B very similar. An insulating factor here, uh, which is why we're pretty bullish on, on the sector, is that um, average millennials 27 years old, and that's a big wide range, it's kind of a wide demographic cohort, but what do you do when you turn 35? You buy a condo, you buy a house, right? So we've been surfing this demographic where the tide can go out, and the person who buys a house lives in a four and five star apartment. 
they don't live in workforce housing. Those people, unfortunately, are never going to buy a house. So, you know, I think apartment, yeah, we got, uh, we've got about 30 basis points increase in vacancies the next six quarters or so. You know, most of that is felt at the high end. And the middle to low end is, is fairly insulated. So, so we have, uh, so to give you the data, home ownership rates are at, uh, have dropped dramatically for that household under 35. They dropped 10 and 12 percentage points. Overall home ownership rates are just up off of a 50 year low. It is tight credit, uh, preference to the millennials delaying marriage, uh, delaying having kids, wanting to be in the urban core. But is it going to change? Are these millennials maybe going to uh, become more like their parents? So I'll start, with, I'm going to ask you that, Melissa, since you're just barely above a millennial <laughs> compared to our other panelist. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so what do I think? So yeah, for, the, for millennials that have the income, and this is an important point, I, I, yeah, I think they'll go buy a house and move to the suburbs and have kids and all that. I, I think most of my cohort has now done that. Um, they don't continue to live in the city. It's just too expensive, right? So you have kids and cities most cities across the U.S., the public schools are definitely not very good. Um, private and, schools, you know how much Melissa's that costs. In, you're in New York metropolitan area, so that is a, uh, certainly true. Yeah, right. And so, and, and so that you do have that whole group, but, but it's sort of an income thing. And, and so if you were higher income to begin with as a millennial, you lived in the urban areas. If you weren't high income, you're probably always in the suburban area anyway, renting. And to Han's point, you'll probably just continue renting. Um, although... What could happen is, um, so you have the, so you have the millennials who are sort of higher income. I think they'll go buy homes, fine, and all that. Then I think you have the millennials who you don't have the income. Either you move from the kind of the really expensive places, right, New York, San Francisco, Boston, and you go to a Raleigh, a Charlotte, a Denver, where it's just cheaper. And you probably go buy a home. Um, maybe you rent if you really can't afford it. But that's probably how this plays out. Um, over the next kind of five, ten years. So, uh, Lee, let me ask you the question. In California, many of you know, happened two days ago, there's going to be a ballot proposition to eliminate something called Costa Hawkins, which is a state law that allows vacancy decontrol and exempts all new construction after 1995. The ballot proposition is to eliminate Costa Hawkins. Would you guys invest in California if this disappeared? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that any regulatory change is going to change the picture for California. It's going to be underhoused, um, and that, that's going to positively affect the rental housing markets um, really, really up and down the coast. So I, I wouldn't see that as a, as a big needle mover either way, to be honest with you. Um, I would, however, look, um, and, and, and I think this echoes uh, Melissa's point, um, at the, the divergence between the urban core and the uh, quote-unquote suburban areas and where we see uh, the best demand going forward potential mismatch in unit sizes. So um, how many studio and one bedroom apartments do you need as millennials mm -hmm. get older? Um, and you can expect to see some backfilling of that, of, uh, of baby boomers. Um, but are they going to fill the studios? Mm, probably not as much. Uh, so, so you see that mismatch. And then you're going to see, um, and this is already happening. Um, by the way, and, and you Eli's documented this, uh, it's, a it, it, it's a misconception that millennials all live in the cities. The vast majority of millennials already live in the suburbs and continue to move to the suburbs. Um, so if you want a, um, a big secret for apartment investing, um, figure out what the schools look like next to the apartment, and you're probably going to be making a pretty good bet. Okay, and this, lastly, Bill, very quickly, over or underweight apartments? Uh, we're overweight, and I think that's a lot of in institutional investors think that way. Um, the two big things are uh, tends to do very well on a downturn or tends to outperform in a downturn. And in our view, it's the least susceptible to technological disruption. It's, it's you know, it's not going to, demand will be based on demographics, not based on some app or something, something that changes, uh, you know, the underlying demand structure. I will say that one, one problem we've seen recently is that uh, municipalities have been very aggressive in increasing property taxes and increasing assessments. Um, you know, all, and we're fighting them all, all the way, but th that's been a big um, miss in terms of our underwriting. And, you know, we're trying to think, how, you know, will that continue? But that's, uh, municipalities need money, and, and this is a good place for them to get it. 
Okay. And it goes, you know, obviously it's a gross rent. So just two more things in apartments. Uh, we have nationally 4.2 million people per year turning uh, age 18 over the next seven years. So still a big input, but again, uh, in uh, some of the key markets like California, uh, Houston, Florida, roughly 25 to 30 percent of all apartment renters are non-citizen foreign-born individuals. So remember, if they really slash legal immigration, if they start deporting large numbers of people, this is a big issue. Uh, and a lot of Trump's big supporters own this stuff, which I have made clear to him. And Ken, to build on that point, if you were to include the sort of steady state immigration we've had, the 25 to 29 year old age cord, a little older than what, what Ken's describing, is pretty flat the next five years. So all these people that have been driving the changes the last 10 years, et cetera, they got older. And so there's a lot of growth in 30 to 34, and they don't do exactly the same things. So you know, if the tide goes out with immigration, as Ken says, it'll be even more dramatic in this fresh out of college bunch. And because all of the millennials are getting a little bit older. Right, and so on that note, we're going to turn to our last section, single family. And you can see the consensus is that single family reduction continues to rise for the next three years, still below equilibrium, long run average, and below demographic needs. But it's been a very slow recovery for this sector of the marketplace. Uh, and I guess we only have that. Uh, there are a few others that are missing, but house prices, again, the consensus forecast has house price growth slowing. So is there any institutional uh, investment in single family land or single family at all, uh, mortgages? Uh, we'll just go down, starting with you, Melissa. Is it something you guys do at all? No. No. Um, I mean, the way you invest in this is you get a platform that's a big enough scale to actually rent out single family homes or you do speculative land development. I don't think that's most of our business. There are people. So you do don't that. do land or the single family rental business? No, but I, I would. Can I, can I redirect a little bit and yeah. talk about, because we've been sure. talking about apartments. First of all, this is one reason to be more bullish about apartments and that structurally housing is undersupplied uh, in many parts of the US. Um, but we've been talking about affordable housing, we've been talking about workforce housing. Um, we haven't talked about manufactured housing. Uh, manufactured mm -hmm. housing is a segment that's become very institutional. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussions about how to provide affordable housing to people. Um, this type of housing already exists and it's becoming an institutional property type. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're an institutional investor looking to participate in that, that's probably an easier way to do than to build up a platform to um, service tens of thousands of single family houses. Bill? Yeah, we don't really play in that, but I, did, I do notice that a lot of the home builder stocks are up a lot recently, so there's something positive going on. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm actually giving the keynote speech a, a week from Friday at the National Association of Realtors. And uh, the emphasis there is how do we get credit available for that first time buyer? Credit has been constrained by Dodd-Frank, by the what I call post-foreclosure stress syndrome. That is, lenders got killed by all the putbacks and all the government policies, and there's no question that that has to be changed and not happen again. FHA still hasn't normalized itself, so a lot of the big lenders aren't working with them. So credit availability is a key thing, but also many of the millennials saw their parents lose their house, uh, and there's stress from them. I was sitting next to one in the airplane who clearly had the income, everything else. She said, but my parents lost their money. I'm not going to buy a house. I'm just going to stick with my Apple stock. So uh, I think there is uh, a portion of millennials who are scarred and, and aren't there. Finally, the supply of available things to buy is constrained. And that's why prices continue to rise. There's a shortage of supply of existing homes all over the country. And so that's why prices still rise uh, double or triple the inflation rate. So the single family sector does have institutional investment capabilities, obviously single family for rent, but also the land development business uh, at the right point in the cycle, people make a lot of money there. Uh, clearly institutional investors have been reluctant after the last cycle, which was caused by the housing downturn. So that's our last consensus slide. So now I'm gonna ask our panel one more question and then we'll to open the floor to questions. What is the one thing, if you were to name one thing, that would upset the forecast, not only macro, but real estate? One, just one thing, it's a lightning round. And so, Hans, maybe we'll start with you. What one thing would upset the, the apple cart? Well, I mentioned the mini tech wreck earlier. I think that's the most likely. Just to kind of have some fun and throw it out there, 
you know, tax reform could be an upside. I think it's more likely that we could get weird and stupid tax reform, and that's a big risk. So, you know, wouldn't it be convenient for somebody in office to say that you can expense all your real estate purchases in the first year and have forever tax deductions? So that happens, the market comes apart, everybody buys real estate the same year, values shoot up, construction shoots up, and we have the RTC crisis again in five years. Not likely, but, you know, We've seen a lot of crazy things the last and, six months. And we do have a person who claims to be a real estate person as president, so possible. <laughs> the, the whole market's built on low, low interest rates, so if interest rates go up 200 basis points, that changes the whole pricing structure. Thank you, Bill. You're listening to my forecast. Uh, uh, since since we're, the, this forecast is about the U.S., uh, my, my guess is that it's something that happens outside of the U.S., um, and, and this, could, this could emanate from Europe, it could emanate from Asia, uh, but I, I, I can't find one thing in the U.S. that's likely to upset the apple cart, as you put it. Yep. And Melissa? Uh, yeah, well, it's actually what you've been driving home, Ken, is the whole immigration. Um, if there's a change to immigration policy, I think it could fairly dramatically affect commercial property. Okay. All right. Well, we've got about 10 minutes for questions from the audience, and I think we have microphones. I see one, two in the middle. Uh, so we'll be happy to have some questions. Uh, we haven't even mentioned the name Trump really very much at all, so we'd be happy to give any of our inside views of what he might do. Uh, and I actually know Bob Corker, so I can give you his views. He's a real estate guy, by the way. Uh, so I'd be happy to give any views. So uh, love to have you come up to... Oh. Okay. That good question. The question is, uh, we didn't talk, survey about niche sectors, but a lot of people are going to niche sectors like senior housing, data centers, uh, student housing, uh, ag land. So maybe we should go down the line, because uh, I know some of you, uh, your companies have done that. So Melissa, what, what have you done anything in these niches, and which ones do you like? Um, not a whole, uh, no, my company's not done a whole lot in the niche uh, sectors, but yes, I, I do think there's some very good demographic plays to be made um, in, stu in senior, potentially student um, data centers. Um, outside of that, if you're asking about farmland or something. Okay. <laughs> no. uh, let, me, let me answer what the public markets are saying. The public markets are saying that the private markets are overvaluing real estate in the core property types and undervaluing real estate in the niche property types. So, um, and while I, I think the magnitude of that is exaggerated, um, we, we actually do see value in, in sectors like manufactured housing and uh, senior, senior housing. Okay, and Bill? Yeah, as, as Lee was saying, oh, almost ha over half the cap rate of the um, NAE rate is, is especially property types, as they call it. So it's very big in the public market. You can track all sorts of data on, on all the different sectors. Um, and I will say that self-storage has become the second, the biggest property type, the niche property type in the NACREF world, it surpassed hotels. So self-storage is popular among institutions, but you know, medical office, truck terminals, there's a whole range of things people are trying to get into because it's higher yields with uh, growing sustainable income. And that's, that's, what, that's what we're all looking for. And Hans, as an analyst, is there one niche, niche that you like? Well, um, I think 55 plus age restricted low service housing is the next thing. And, and with regards to the, the, the person's uh, question, you know, if you institutionalize anything and create more research and make it in, you know, okay for an institution to buy, the cap rates go down. And the definition of what acceptable real estate is just keeps getting broader. Okay. So, and the, the second part, and I think this applies to a lesser extent to student housing, is that um, it became accepted, the cap rates went down, that doesn't make it intelligent. I think there's a lot of losses to be seen in some of these sector too. Okay, got questions right there, thank you. Going back uh, to uh, industrial, what is the forecast for manufacturing and what sectors and, and what areas of the country have a, a positive outlook? So uh, manufacturing, anyone wanna take that? Uh, what's the outlook for manufacturing uh, in the U.S. and what sectors of the country might uh, uh, benefit from, from that. For manufacturing? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at the big, uh, the big blue wall in the Midwest that, that elected Trump, um, they are the people who, this is one of the few areas of the country 
where you could say, if we put up protectionist barriers, where don't you have job losses? And I think that's, that's potentially there, but a little bit more in the, in the non-union Southeast. So, so that could happen. Otherwise, um, you know, uh, job losses have been happening in China in, in manufacturing. We've had them for 60 years. So output is up, but that doesn't mean it's going to translate into a lot of jobs. Uh, I think the real industrial story is around housing. You know, housing production eats up a lot of light industrial space, um, and that's very good for that market, which feels like you bought an industrial building. One, other... one, one area that's yeah. booming right now in manufacturing is right around the Tesla plant in, in uh, uh, East Bay area. So all sorts of suppliers are leasing space, doing assembly. So that's, that's an area where, uh, you know, it's manufacturing's driven that, that sort of uh, southern part of the East Bay. Anyone else? You don't have to, unless you have something. I, I mean, okay. I just, there's a little bit of uncertainty in that question around the NAFTA negotiations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having, having said that, um, that, that either means that uh, under the current NAFTA structure, that manufacturing activity continues to move into the U.S. slowly rather than move out, but that's very highly automated manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that manufacturing activity is, or it moves in a little bit faster, but again, very highly automated manufacturing right. activity. It's it stuff, it's not jobs. Yeah, yeah. It, and it doesn't necessarily, space, trans it doesn't yeah. necessarily it's translate into a lot of industrial demand. It's important to say that, that we have one and a half million less manufacturing jobs than before the Great Recession, but we're reducing more output. Those robots really work. Next question. Melissa, you had mentioned that we may see a large repurposing of retail. How does the panel think that retail may be repurposed if it is? All right. How do we repurpose that uh, B and C mall or other things? Uh, we've had a little bit of answer already. Anyone want to take a shot at that? Uh, the yeah, I, I mean, it, it could be, you know, Bill already alluded to the uh, industrial property being put on the C mall, but it, it could be, you know, multifamily. Um, I, it, it could be industrial. I mean, I think it's anyone's guess. It, I, it's really going to depend on the location mm -hmm. of that retail property, because um, you wouldn't, if it was actually a good location, which it's probably not, you're not going to put probably industrial property, but it's probably it's a, largely going to depend on the It's, it's location. a lot of hard work to make, you know, make it to medical office, apartments, other things. Uh, it just depends on location. Location's really it, but uh, we have a couple of our uh, audience who specialize in that. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, it's uh, basically adaptive reuse in a dramatic way. So uh, any more questions from the audience? We have one in front. Uh, oh, one back there first, and then uh, if you can get back in the microphone, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the uh, question of suburban office that the panel brought up as a good opportunity. I'm wondering if you can define that a little bit better. Are we talking about suburban office that's more a node of high rise, it's just kind of off some freeways, or a transit oriented node, or more of a sprawling business park, and maybe to talk a little bit about some of the tenants that would be in that. Are we talking large tenants that fill up most of the buildings, or an entire campus, or more of a small tenant, local, um, uh, you know, type of, type of businesses? Anyone want to take a shot of that? I could, I, I could start. Bill brought up that we, he doesn't own a lot of suburban office. We also think that we don't own a lot of suburban office. A, a lot of this is definitional. Um, there's a lot of office that is owned by institutional investors that is classified as suburban. Um, it's a very geographically specified definition based on zip codes. Um, and, and so the, 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 the difference between a well amenitized suburban building uh, in a dense location with transit and, and good access is completely different from the, the, a traditional um, isolated suburban office building. Mm -hmm. um, and the, there is an opportunity to invest in suburban office. Um, the, the issue is, is that uh, a lot of the lower quality office buildings uh, are what Bill mentioned are, are available at 7, 8, 10, 12 percent cap rates. Um, you don't actually know what you're capping when you buy that. Um, it's a little uncertain, whereas the, the higher quality trades much more in line um, with, with a traditional CBD uh, office. So that arbitrage is a little bit difficult to execute. Yeah, you have to really put, put it, figure out the amenity package in terms of gyms and common areas and a decent, you know, eating experience. You know, we've all seen that cafe in the, in the base of uh, suburban office buildings that, you know, after the third time, you don't want to go there. So I think that's, that's hard. I mean, and, and you need that cap. You need to put a lot of capital in. But, you know, at some you know, if, if you do it right, there are tenants. And, and you know, most of our, as we said, most millennials live in the suburbs. Most company, most of employment's in the suburbs. 
It's not all coming to downtown Chicago. It's, it's staying uh, out, you know, in, in where, where its, it's uh, um, owners and its, and its, and its uh, current workers are, have been for years. Over there, and then we have two quick questions. We've got about uh, two minutes, so quick. Thank you, Ken. Just two points. One, the young man asked about uh, reimagining B and C malls. It's, uh, the answer is idiosyncratic. Each one is different, and as you mentioned, Ken, very time consuming. Uh, there was a question raised before about why is the, is the volume of transactions off 19%? You sort of answered it. There's a lot of debt options. So people come to the market with their property and don't get a price they like and they just refinance is what we're seeing. Thank you. All right, one more. At last year's um, meeting, Ken, yours was the only session that I attended that even touched on politics, uh, particularly in advance of the election. You seem to have intimated that you'd like to express yourself in that regard. And uh, <laughs> given, given your... Rex Tillerson has said it all. Yeah, well, given your Berkeley perspective, I, for one, at least, would love to hear your views. Well, I, I give give an opportunity for Berkeley to speak. Okay. Uh, I can't speak for Berkeley, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm the type of person who went to the Romney meetings and stuff. So, uh, but I think the problem uh, is, is that the pro-business agenda appealed to a lot of people. And I think we have not seen any of it get through, except for the deregulatory uh, types of things. I think we do have a re need to have tax reform, no question. But with this, basically the way it is now, unlikely to get anything other than tax cuts, which will increase the deficit. So at full employment, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I, wouldn't do, I would not have extreme fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus when you're at full employment. It just isn't right. Uh, but it's very hard to communicate with the people in Washington now. It's really not a group of people you can talk to. So I, I'm quite worried that uh, both on a foreign policy point of view, uh, but it's not just here. It's happening all over the globe, this populist movement, anti-globalism, essentially. So I think it's a big worry. Uh, and if you're a student of history and read what happened in Europe in the 20s, uh, if we got a huge stock market crash and big turmoil, it could lead to some really bad things. Uh, I don't know how ec the economy, uh, he's claiming credit for it, but I'd say that is really just a little bit of his deregulatory policy, but 95% was already in place. So as long as we don't screw it up, I think we're okay. If we do, have deep tax cuts, I think that will give us more inflation mm -hmm. and higher interest rates and in the end, we'll create that uh, recession scenario two or three years down the road, the sugar high basically. But I'll let you guys say anything else you'd like to say on uh, policy. We won't go into personality, we'll just do policy. <laughs> well, I completely agree with your take on the situation, by the way, I agree with, with each of your points. And I think, you know, as Melissa alluded to earlier, it's the immigration policy that really scares me as a real estate person. Uh, you know, we've, as, as Bobby Jindal said, you know, we got a really low fence and uh, a high gate. You can get in here illegally and mow my lawn, but you can't stay here legally after you graduate and pay taxes. And nobody's talking about fixing that situation. And that's what really fills buildings and grows the economy. Thank you all for being here.